Good morning, good evening, and good day. This is your host, producer and engineer, Roy of Hollywood, welcoming you again to Something's Happening. We'll be here till 6 a.m. with Dynamite Radio for Night People. And uh, we're going to look deeply into the wonderful world of ethnopharmacological plants and plant helpers and plant healers with Jonathan Ott live in studio. First time in a couple of years. Hi, Jonathan. Good evening. Uh, uh, nice to be on your show as always. Well, I'm honored to have you here up from Mexico and uh, we're going to have to uh, identify you for our newer listeners. Um, you're a chemist. Nominally so. Uh, I do have some training in chemistry. Actually, now I'm more engaged in writing as a career rather than chemistry. But, uh, yes, I'm, I'm a phytochemist, and my specialty is entheogenic plants or shamanic inebriants or plant teachers and their ethnopharmacognosy. What is a phytochemist and what is ethnopharmacognosy? Well, a phytochemist is one who studies the chemistry of plants. Uh, I'm a natural products chemist, and I specialize in plants. Ethnopharmacognosy, you often hear the term ethnopharmacology. Uh, I prefer the term ethnopharmacognosy in as much as pharmacology is the study of the effects of drugs in intact bodies. And uh, I feel that what shamans do is better described by the word pharmacognosy, which is the study of the production, cultivation, processing, and use of drugs. And so I prefer the term ethnopharmacognosy, but it's more or less interchangeable with ethnopharmacology. Um, what is the difference between drugs and plants and in this study? Between drugs and plants? Well, uh, as far as uh, the scientific definition is concerned, a plant is simply a crude drug. Um, and but uh, a drug is a crude plant, <laughs> right, or whatever. But uh, uh, drug is unfortunately a loaded term these days, <clears throat> and uh, it has acquired rather a pejorative connotation. Um, drug, strictly speaking, is something bad in our culture, and uh, I think for many people, what drug means is something illegal, something dangerous, something prohibited. Uh, Alcohol, however dangerous it might be, is not usually considered to be a drug. I would use a broader designation, and for me, a, a, a broader definition of drug would be any pharmacologically active substance, plant, chemical, uh, extract of plant, etc. So, um, let me see, I'll go over, you, you have written, um, and we have discussed in the past, um, the pharmacotheon on entheogenic drugs, they are plant sources in history. It's sort of everything you could possibly want to know about every plant, uh, pharmacotheon. And quite a few things you probably didn't want to know as well. In my head. <laughs> and, and then uh, their most recent book, Ayahuasca Analogs, uh, Pantheon, Pangeon and Theogens, and then uh, sort of secret, I thought it was out of print, the uh, Cacahuatl Eater, the Ruminations of an Unabashed Chocolate Addict. Yes. And I've just published a new book, uh, Hot Off the Press, so to speak, and it's entitled uh, The Age of Entheogens and the Angel's Dictionary. And uh, this consists of two essays. Uh, the first is uh, The Age of Entheogens, the Pharmacratic Inquisition, and the Entheogenic Reformation. And it's an historical theory concerning the importance of entheogens in archaic religion, of entheogens meaning what some people call hallucinogens or psychedelics, but in this case the plants themselves, the shamanic plants, shamanic inebriants or plant teachers, um, and there's the suppression of their use by what I have chosen to call the pharmacratic inquisition. And uh, the phenomenon that we are seeing in the world today, which I call the entheogenic reformation, constitutes a rediscovery or a rebirth in use of these archaic sacramental plants. Uh, the second essay in the book is entitled The Angel's Dictionary, and it is, in fact, a dictionary of words pertaining to uh, sacred inebriants, ecstatic states, and allied topics. Uh, it has about uh, 320 words. Uh, backed up by definitions from, uh, uh, sorry, by citations supporting the definitions. Are these uh, many languages or just? Yes, the um, the words are derived from uh, 
Well, there, of course, the center of gravity in this case is English, but uh, there are also some 70 words, if memory serves me, from non-Indo-European languages, uh, from various indigenous tongues and so forth. Uh, Non-European languages, sorry. Some of them are Indo-European, some not. Um, and uh, it's uh, there are definitions are supported by quotations in the manner of the Oxford English Dictionary. I think there are a total of about 450 quotations called from classical drug and general literature. Uh, entheogens, strange new word. Entheogens. How does uh, what does it mean, and why why is this term used uh, instead of? Uh, uh, the usual psychedelic plants or what other else? Psychedelic hallucinogenic. Been the most hallucinogenic, right? Well, the, the commonest terms for this are psychedelic and hallucinogenic. Hallucinogenic is the most widely used term in the scientific literature. Psychedelic is the most widely used term in the counterculture and does have a, a good deal of currency in the scientific literature as well. Well, we proposed the term entheogen in 1979 in the Journal of Psychedelic Drugs, now the Journal of Psychoactive Drugs. Uh, a committee, an informal committee organized by my late teacher, R. Gordon Wasson, Carl Ruck, uh, professor of classics at Boston University, and Danny Staples, also a classicist from Boston University, Jeremy Bigwood, and myself. We were looking for a term to describe uh, what I would call um, shamanic inebriance, plants used by shamans to achieve ecstasy or out-of-body experiences or extraordinary states of consciousness, as they're sometimes called. The problem with hallucinogenic is that it is based on the notion of an hallucination, which to psychiatrists is a sign of pathology and a symptom of uh, pathological That's saying something that isn't there, really there. Exactly. You think it's, it's there. a lie. The essence of hallucination is you're seeing something that's not there, a distortion, a, a, a false perception. And uh, psychedelic, um, the problem I see with psychedelic is that it is uh, grounded in 60s countercultural use. The, really, the prototypical psychedelic drug is LSD. That's mainly what people took in the psychedelic era. And this, as we all know, is a product of modern pharmacological science. It has not yet been found to occur in a plant, although it may someday be found uh, to do so. Um, and so we speak of psychedelic music, psychedelic art. It's very definitely founded in the, the 1960s, especially in the United States. And uh, it uh, refers to, to non-traditional uh, use of these substances. And it seems to me in Congress to speak of shamanic use of a psychedelic plant because of this connotation. And I might add that it has a decidedly pejorative connotation for people that are not in the counterculture. If you mention the word psychedelic, uh, it, it evokes a very dirty specific, hippie, right? Crazy, exactly. uh, dirtbag hippie, uh, Mansonite, whatever. So um, entheogen means specifically it derives from uh, entheos, entheoi, a Greek root that means uh, divine within. Literally, uh, we use the root commonly of the word enthusiasm, which means inspired by the divine. Literally, the divine is breathed into one. That's the true meaning of enthusiasm. Entheos. And so entheogen, uh, adding the root, gen, uh, sorry, the suffix gen meaning becoming, it gives you a word that means roughly becoming divine within. And we felt that this, it's not meant to describe the chemistry of these substances, nor is it meant to describe their pharmacology. It's meant to describe the cultural context of their use, or what we would call the set and setting. And so uh, we felt that that, best described the traditional use of these substances. And so it enables us to speak in the same breath of very diverse substances with very diverse pharmacological action. For example, those that favor the use of psychedelic, they're in agreement that the psilocybin and mushrooms are psychedelic. They would say that peyote and mescaline is psychedelic. But they will say normally, well, but the Amanita muscaria mushroom is not psychedelic. Neither is salvia divinorum psychedelic. So we needed a word to talk in the same breath about all of these substances, some of them with quite distinct pharmacological effects, and they're not uh, all of them classic psychedelics in the mold of psilocybin, mescaline, uh, ergot alkaloids like LSD. 
Um, and so entheogen fits the bill. I, I, I would have to say that it's become widely accepted in the ethnographic literature. It's become the predominant term, in fact, in, in Spanish uh, in general, but it hasn't gained any type of a, uh, acceptance um, in the medical community nor among chemists and pharmacologists, but that's not surprising. It wasn't designed for them. Okay, I want to also uh, place you a, a, a little bit more in historical context. Uh, you mentioned your teacher, one of your teachers, R. Gordon Wasson. Yes. Now, R. Gordon Wasson sort of discovered for the modern uh, world, our modern world, uh, the mushroom. Really. Yes. Gordon Wasson was a banker from uh, born in Montana, uh, worked in, lived in most of his career, worked in New York. And he and his wife, who was a Russian physician, embarked on a study of the linguistics of mushroom names in the 1920s, uh, which they pursued very diligently over many years. Uh, and by the time uh, the 50s drew around, they discovered uh, the use, the surviving, uh, rediscovered, I should say, the surviving use of what we now know to be psilocybin mushrooms in Oaxaca. And it was on the, the night of the 29th through 30th of June, 1955, that Gordon Wasson, together with his photographer Alan Richardson, first became the first outsiders on record intentionally to ingest these psilocybin mushrooms in a shamanic ritual with the Mazatec shaman Maria Sabina in the state of Oaxaca and Huautla de Jimenez. And uh, this really, two years later, Wasson published an uh, uh, he and his wife published an important book called Mushrooms, Russian History, which has had literally no impact on history in general because there were only 500 copies and uh, it has uh, very difficult to get. It's sold for as much as $10,000 a copy now. But that uh, simultaneously they published an article in Life magazine, rather Gordon Wasson did, and Valentina, his wife, published an article in This Week magazine, the Sunday Supplement, the same week. Uh, and it was it were these two articles, especially the article in Life, which was called Seeking the Magic Mushroom, which really brought this to the attention of the world and catalyzed uh, the psychedelic 60s. Although mescaline had been known since 1896, it hadn't uh, been used much beyond fairly small and esoteric circles, mainly in Europe and secondarily in the United States. The LSD was discovered, its effect was discovered in 1943 in that the properties, extraordinary potency and properties of it were published in 1947. Uh, these were sort of waiting in the wings uh, there and ready. But it was this article in Life magazine, as far as we can tell, that really catalyzed this modern interest in use of these substances. And that started uh, for a time also the rush to Mexico and uh, by the by tourists interested in the mushrooms and the mushroom experience. And uh, I remember correct. one of the uh, poignant thoughts of your book uh, on ayahuasca analogs is that you hope, um, as part of your work, to turn off the tap of tourism Yes, as we can make these things ourselves without leaving our own backyard. So yes, exactly. Um, when Wasson published the Life magazine article, he changed the name of the village, he changed the name of the people, he changed the name of Maria Savina. But in Mushrooms Russian History, the actual facts were given. And much to his surprise, within a couple of years, large numbers of tourists on their own initiative were going to Wautla, neighboring villages, and uh, they drew the wrong kind of attention to this phenomenon. Uh, suddenly, um, the government had stationed garrisons of soldiers and police in Wautla. They were deporting busloads of foreigners. Maria Savina and other shamans served jail sentences in Oaxaca City for allegedly pandering to this mushroomic tourist trade. And the mushrooms were illegalized in Mexico, and, and bad political attention was attracted to them. Now, that, that, eventually, that tourism eventually waned largely because it was found that the mushrooms grew all over the world. And by the mid-70s, myself and uh, some of my colleagues had published books and uh, not only on how to identify the wild mushrooms that grew in North America, Europe, Australia, the South Pacific, and so forth, but books uh, describing very uh, simplified and efficient methods for cultivating them, which gave rise to uh, a truck farm sort of black market production for these things, which has been very much refined, and that put an end to this mushroomic tourism. Now we're seeing the same kind of thing in South America, 
what I call ayahuasca tourism, especially developed in Peru, secondarily in Ecuador, and rudimentarily in Brazil. And uh, this is most unfortunate because there's presently no stigma whatever attached to ayahuasca in South America. But it will only take, uh, and I might add that wh- whereas the mushroomic tourism was ad hoc, it was more or less uh, individuals on their own initiative, now there are uh, people organizing tour groups and advertising in magazines like Shaman's Drum and Magical Blend, and uh, there are fairly sophisticated operations uh, r- around this ayahuasca tourism. And it, it, it will only accelerate the degradation of these traditions, uh, however inevitable that might be, in, in situ, attract the wrong kind of political attention, cause uh, legal problems for the shamans that use these uh, things like ayahuasca traditionally, and we know now that the, it is possible to make analogs of ayahuasca. It is possible to make ayahuasca from other plants that grow on other continents. And there's really no reason for this. And I feel that if people could make, the, make this themselves, not only would they not wish to spend $3,000 going on an ayahuasca tour, but they would also uh, probably have a more serious use. They would, uh, in, rather than seeing it as a type of commodity that you pay to get access to, they would establish a personal relationship with growing the plants, learn how to process them themselves, and I feel in general this would be conducive to more satisfactory experiences. You also uh, worked um, sort of with Albert Hoffman, who discovered, accidentally discovered LSD, and you translated his book, his original book, into English, LSD, My Problem Child. Yes, in uh, uh, the German edition came out in '79, and the English in 1980, and that's still in print in a paperback edition from Tarcher in Los Angeles. Okay, so I think that establishes you in uh, in C2, if not in history. Uh, <laughs> I hope so. Um, is what you're studying, what you're bringing out? Uh, worth a worthwhile addition to our culture, or is this uh, unleashing a destructive force? Well, that's a hard question to answer. Uh, it's not for me to say. Perhaps <laughs> uh, certainly, I think it's a worthwhile addition to our culture. I think it's the I see I see entheogens in this uh, end of century, end of millennium, decade as a sort of I call it a healing balm for the lesions of materialism. Uh, I see it as being about the only hope we have for reducing or reversing rather the destructive uh, trend that is so evident in the world today, ecological destruction, habitat destruction, uh, species extinction. Um, I think the only, the only thing that really holds out sufficient hope for for reversing that is the entheogenic experience. So in that sense, I feel it is definitely a positive cultural influence. On the other hand, I would say that uh, the, in part what I call the pharmacratic inquisition or the suppression of the use of plant sacraments or entheogens historically is very, has very much to do with the fact that these represent a threat to authority, uh, to hierarchical power structures and centralized authority systems, and they very accurately perceive this as being a threat to them. And so in that sense, it's subversive and uh, is destructive to the powers that be. How would you describe the entheogenic experience and what it can add or subtract in your life? Boy, is that a big question. Right. Yes, it is. And I, well, I will preface it by saying I can only describe it for myself. And I, I know that uh, this experience is very variable, both uh, in any one individual and from one individual to another, even talking about the same plant or plant extract at the same dose in the same physical setting, same time of day, whatever. Uh, there's a considerable individual variation, and, and I will underscore again, I'm only speaking for myself. But if I were to try and put it into scientific terms, I would say it enables one to see the universe more as energy and less as matter. Uh, that's why I see it as being a healing balm for the lesions of materialism. It's, uh, the, the concept of hallucinogen is totally wrong in, the, in that uh, 
it presupposes that when one takes a substance like this, it's distorting perception to such an extent that one sees hallucinations, falsities, things that aren't there, inaccurate perceptions. I see these substances rather as de-hallucinogens, uh, and I think that's a, a pretty typical traditional conception of them. In, uh, de-hallucinogens. De-hallucinogens. In other words, uh, to put it in the terms of, that the Hindus use, the, the world is maya or illusion. Uh, our, pers- our quotidian or everyday perception of the world as solid and material, as permanent, that is definitely an hallucination. Uh, if you look at the, some of the far-out theories of modern physics and so forth, uh, it's not really the way the world is supposed to be. And when, if we look at it scientifically, we conceive of the universe or uh, the physical universe as consisting of space and energy. And... Uh, this, the appearance of solidity or uh, solid objects is is strictly an artifact of the coarseness of our level of perception. If we had a much finer level of perception, we wouldn't be able to perceive solidity. And so I feel when when I take entheogens, I I get into this more or less non-materialistic state where I perceive the universe more as energy or you could say as spirit, less as matter. And uh, in the right circumstances, it's not perceived as matter at all, but just as energy and dynamic flux. That's what science tells us is there. And uh, obviously, for survival purposes, we need to perceive the world as solid and, and material. Now, our, our brain, we tend to think of our sensory organs as windows onto the world, but uh, it's also possible to conceive of them as filters, filtering out, uh, what Blake called ch- narrow chinks in the cavern, filtering out a very small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum of the energy that we're surrounded by and indeed bathed in. So our senses can be seen as filters that filter out a very small segment of that, which can be processed by our nervous system, which as impressive as it is, is relatively puny compared to this uh, amazing uh, display of energy that the universe represents. And so, in, in some way, the entheogens either change the frequency setting, they, they, they expand the bandwidth, they, they enable us to perceive, in my opinion, to have a more accurate perception of the universe, a more accurate perception of something, energy and dynamic flux. Now, the appearance of solidity is an artifact of I, I believe neuro, neurologically something like 70% of the input into our brains is optical through the optic nerve and, and uh, we know our linguistic system and so forth is very much tied to visual perception. Uh, so much so that with our optical, with our eyes, what we see are reflections off of surfaces. So we're getting a very superficial view on the world. Uh, we're just seeing reflections off of surfaces. And... Uh, I think that the entheogens tend to de-emphasize that, and uh, I don't pretend to understand it on a neurological level or a neurochemical level, and anyone who says they do is probably lying because we really don't have enough information to to uh, to come up with a coherent theory for this. But in as simple terms as I can come up with, I would say that it makes you enables you to see the em- the universe more as energy less as matter. And in that sense, it's a type of a de-hallucinogen because that's the way the universe is. How does hemp fit into the um, family of entheogens? Well, again, uh, entheogen is a concept that refers to the context of use rather than uh, any particular type of pharmacology or chemistry. But uh, certainly hemp has been and is still used as an entheogen. It has a very prominent role in, in India, religious role in India and in Nepal, and in, in, uh, especially the Shivainite brands, branches of, uh, of Hinduism. It's also used as an entheogen in the, the Coptic Zion Church, the Rastafari religion. It is also used uh, in the Santo Daime religion in in South America, although because of legal problems, that's become more or less something that people don't talk about. Uh, but it certainly has a role there. Um, it, again, it's entheogen is a concept relating to the context of use rather than the pharmacology. I think most people that have familiarity with these substances tend to class cannabis along with this, the, the shamanic inebriants. Uh, on the other hand, personally, from my own um, 
standpoint, my own use, and again, anything I say about this is just based on my own experience and it's my own opinion, uh, I don't find it to be as useful to me as are substances like psilocybin, mushrooms, ayahuasca, uh, peyote, mescaline, and so forth. But it's, again, it's a very individual thing. Could you talk about um, plant intelligence, interaction with plants and the intelligence of, of consciousness of plants? Well, the existence of yes, um, I guess I'm not really an expert on that, but I'll I could say a few words about it. Uh, we hear a lot about plant spirits, and the, and these plants are conceived of in many traditional cultures as being teachers, plant teachers that uh, can teach. Personally, I think that plants are superior beings to animals, and in that they can make their own energy from the sun, they make their own carbohydrates from solar energy and minerals and water from the soil. Uh, we see them as being a type of an inferior life, but it's a different type of a life form, and in many ways it's far superior, something that can set up and deploy, root itself in the ground and deploy its own solar collectors is pretty sophisticated. As far as the idea of plant consciousness and plant intelligence, I think everything that's alive has some form of consciousness or is intelligent. Life itself is intelligence. And uh, any any organism is capable of reacting to its environment in very sophisticated ways. Uh, it's more a question of the speed at which this happens that really affects our perception, perhaps, of how intelligent it is. But as far as the question of whether the plants are actively teaching us or reaching out to us to convey information. Personally, I haven't perceived it that way. I don't have any basis for rejecting that or arguing against it. Uh, I don't uh, particularly disbelieve it or or believe it. My my inclination as a natural scientist is to think something along these lines, a more mechanistic, some would say reductionistic approach, that the fact that plants contain dimethyltryptamine, for example, which is also found in the human and other animal nervous systems, is not in and of itself surprising because it's a fairly simple compound that would be on the pathway from tryptophan, the amino acid, to any number of uh, biochemicals that are found in, in many plants and animals. Now, plants like us are trying to solve the same problems of survival in this ecosystem with the same building blocks and uh, nature has a law of, by the law of parsimony, some things are tried early on and work and they tend to become more or less universal through all uh, uh, co-evolved creatures. And so I think rather that it's more of a type of a coincidence that the plants contain dimethyltryptamine, uh, which is a neuro, some, appears to be a type of neurotransmitter in our nervous system and other animal nervous systems. And so when we take it, we get this extraordinary effect. Personally, I don't perceive it as the plant reaching out to me to teach me something. Definitely something is being taught. But uh, I think it's not uh, a communication from plant to human being in, this, in, in any kind of sense in which I understand the term of communication. But that's just my particular bias. I don't have any uh, reason to argue against that if people have the other bias. You're very broad-minded. <laughs> what are um, some of the dangers of experimenting, becoming acquainted with the entheogenic plants? Well, I can't deny that with there... With a specific are, reference to diet as part of that. I see. Uh, referring to ayahuasca, for example. Well, uh, there are definitely dangers involved in this. Uh, I have been criticized by some people for... I have a more or less libertarian philosophy, uh, political philosophy and economic ph philosophy, and I feel that it's best to put these substances in the hands of people who want access to them. And so I'm interested in spreading technology, both uh, the genetic packaging, the seeds, the strains of uh, plants that are suitable for this purpose, as well as technology for their, for their processing and use, so that people, as I said, can develop their own relationship with the plants and uh, learn how to handle them themselves. Now, some people think that this is a bad thing, that you need a guide, you need a, a spiritual guide, you need a, a teacher, 
that's experienced in their use. And I'm not denying the, the value of that as well. Uh, clearly, that's, uh, that's also important. But information can also be got from books. And, uh, and there are, in fact, in our culture, in the United States, in the late 20th century, there are a number of people that have been using these substances for decades. And uh, they, they, many of them consider themselves to be shamans and call themselves such, and uh, perhaps they are. Perhaps we have developed our own type of shaman, urban shamans, basement shamans, uh, and those are some of the terms that have been used. White shamans is another term that I've heard. And so, uh, but what are the dangers? Now, some would say poisoning, overdose, and so forth. It happens that these substances are remarkably non-toxic as a rule, with a few exceptions. If you talk about psilocybin mushrooms or LSD or mescaline or uh, the DMT, that the uh, active or visionary agent in ayahuasca, they're remarkably non-toxic substances. And so the danger of poisoning is is nil, assuming that one knows what one is getting. Now, when you have these things illegalized by our governments, uh, then you get the problem of adulteration, of misrepresentation, uh, and when where, where black markets are involved. In fact, the authorities are defaulting on their responsibilities to protect the public health in this regard. They, they should be pragmatic and admit that people are going to use these substances, whether we like it or not, and it's our responsibility to make sure that they are using them safely. Some of the European governments are already taking this attitude. Uh, Holland is a notable example where they even have uh, heroin mobiles that go around in Amsterdam on a pointed rounds of stops, give medical exams, clean syringes, condoms, uh, and so forth, and, and, and clean, sterile, pure drugs rather than what's available on the black market. So a lot of what are considered to be the problems of toxicity and so forth are not are artifacts of the black market. Now, if people have access, this is one of the reasons why I favor people developing a relationship with the plants and learning to process them themselves, because then they can know what they are getting and, uh, and, and come to master that technology themselves. There's also the danger, I, I will have to say in no uncertain terms, that entheogens are not for everyone. Uh, some people with particular psychological problems find these things to have rather an irritating or exacerbating effect on underlying problems. But usually, in the great majority of the cases, not every case, people of that type, once they've been exposed on a single occasion to substances like this, avoid them like the plague. And there are some few people that uh, have bad reactions to them that seek them out and keep self-administering them. But, um, well, people hurt themselves in many ways, uh, not just with drugs. And so, uh, but there, I don't feel it's particularly dangerous in the context of modern urban life in Los Angeles, for example. There are many things, I think, just going down the freeway is probably more dangerous than, than, uh, cruising the freeways of the mind with entheogens. Do you have any inkling on how widespread the use is of entheogenic plants? In the United States? In the U.S. and in the world? Well, the government did a telephone survey some years ago. <laughs> and, uh, of course, you, you could legitimately ask how many people are going to tell the truth about their illicit drug use when the government phones up and says, we want to know. Uh, and nevertheless... Just from that phone survey, the government estimated one million users in the United States. So I would say we have to at least double and probably quadruple that figure to get at a, a, a more realistic estimate. Not talking about cannabis, just talking about ayahuasca, mushrooms, LSD, mescaline-type drugs. Uh, I would say we're probably looking, just a ballpark estimate, three to five million in the United States, or some something around one to two percent of the population. Uh, fairly small. Uh, on a worldwide basis, it may actually be, uh, it's hard to say. I, we really don't know enough to be able to say, but uh, maybe that would apply on a worldwide basis. Maybe the chances are the use is maybe heavier in the U.S. than it is in some countries. Now, uh, there's this new book that I have not seen, uh, which is just out. Yes. And it is called The Age of Entheogens and the Angel's Dictionary. Yes. Could you go into some detail about what, uh, what you, what you've done with this? Yes, gladly. Uh, the first essay, it's a, a fairly short essay, uh, The Age of Entheogens, the Pharmacratic Inquisition, and the Entheogenic Reformation. 
And this is an historical theory regarding the importance and history of use of these plant teachers or plant sacraments. And so basically I talk about what my teacher Gordon Wasson called the age of entheogens or the preliterate world in general or what some people choose to call the primitive world. Uh, I don't, or primitive cultures, I don't use that term because it, it automatically makes us advanced without having to do anything to earn that qualification. And, uh, it, what some, do you mean? We do war, child abuse, <laughs> um, environmental pollution with the best of Environmental them. destruction and genocide. And, all. Right. And so, um, so I use the term preliterate. Some people object to that, but it more or less gets the point across. So uh, the age of entheogens is that era in human cultural development or religious evolution, shall we say, in which the entheogens reigned supreme, uh, not just in a shamanic context, but also in as com- communal substances in organized religions, like the famous Eleusinian Mysteries in ancient Greece. Um, and the age of entheogens still lives on today in, in Amazonia, in the remote parts of the Sierra Madre in Mexico and in other countries, but but basically for purposes of historical theory, theory making and so forth, I I established that in the book that the age of entheogens in the old world, or I call it also Paleogea, ended at the end of the fourth century, strictly speaking, in the year 395 A.D. or exactly 1600 years ago this year when the Eleusinian mystery cult was destroyed by the goth king Alaric, putting an end to an organized religious communion that had endured for almost 2,000 years and involved an annual initiatory rite in which the um, the mystes, or initiates, were given a potion called the kikion, or which means mixture, and it seems to have been a potion containing um, psychoactive or entheogenic ergot alkaloids, and then they experienced a great vision and... Uh, which converted them into epoptes, those who had seen, and uh, or epoptai is the plural, and so uh, from miste to epoptai, and so the age of entheogens drew to a, a dramatic close at the end of the fourth century in Europe, and uh, several events preceded the destruction of the Eleusinian mysteries, notably Constantine. Uh, reunified the Roman Empire had been fragmented into three branches and in the year 324 Constantine reunified the Roman Empire the following year he convened the famous Council of Nicaea in which 300 Christian bishops codified a particular dogmatic version of the Christian faith and and uh, some years later Christianity was officially declared the state religion of the Roman Empire and in, in a very dramatic fashion the Christians went from food for the lions in the Colosseum to the avenging persecutors of the pagan past, and uh, by by the uh, the the year 384, another significant event was the conversion of Augustine from the Manichaean religion, which was an entheogen-based religion, to Christianity, and he immediately denounced the Manichaeans, and uh, and went on to become a very important force in Christian philosophy. By the year 391. Uh, the emperor, then the emperor was Theodosius I. He decreed not only expropriation of the property of all of the pagan temples, but illegalized any other religion in the Roman Empire besides Christianity. And that same year, the bishop Theophilus I of Alexandria led one of the great destructions of ancient art and literature in the Library of Alexandria. And uh, four years later, the Goth King Alaric destroyed the the sanctuary at Eleusis and put an end to the Eleusinian mysteries, which was really the, a type of spiritual beacon or, or omphalos or, or spiritual center of the ancient world. This really marked the ascendancy of this new religion, the Christian religion. And so uh, the, the age of entheogens, we can say pretty definitely came to an end in the year 395 in, in the old world. And then there succeeded a, a, a thousand year reign of terror of uh, the the, the Christian theocracy, the, the the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church of Rome, destroying any of the competing religions. Uh, why were they so vigorously trying to do this? Because their religion was based on a placebo sacrament. The sacrament had been reduced to a mere symbol, and uh, and if if the Marx had access to the real thing, if they could go to another religious cult like the Eleusinian Mysteries and have a real sacrament 
it would be patently obvious that what the Christians were selling was a type of a shell game. Now, there's a real magic drug, prestidigitation. Uh, the, they were the 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 wafers and wine were magically transmogrified into a sacrament. And this actually wasn't codified in Catholic dogma until the 11th century as the doctrine of transubstantiation, which said basically that the priest, with his back to the congregation and mumbling in a low voice in Latin some words over over the, the bread and the wine, would magically transmogrify them into a sacrament. So... Uh, so it, it's not a coincidence, or uh, not even surprising either, that this 1,000-year reign of terror that I call the Pharmocratic Inquisition, directed against the surviving entheogen cults in Europe, uh, coincides with what we call the Dark Ages. Uh, this, uh, the, the destruction of, in, in order to suppress this, they had to destroy all the ancient art and literature referring to this, and since it was a fundamental feature of ancient thought, uh, basically. Uh, this set humankind back a millennium, and uh, the reign of terror came to a, a, a type of a climax in the beginning of the 13th century with the Albigensian Crusades, uh, which were directed against the Albigensians or Cathari, who were survivors, uh, they were Manichaeans living in Europe, and this was a very important uh, religion competing with Christianity, which traced its ancestry back to the Indo-Aryans, to the the a Zoroastrian faith, and was almost certainly based on the ingestion of an entheogenic sacrament, probably a mushroom, and likely Amanita muscaria. And, uh, the, the very ferocity of the Albigensian Crusade in which a million people were killed in the south of France and adjacent areas of Catalonia and Euskadi or the Basque country testifies to the importance of this to the Catholic Church. It was decreed, I think, in the year 129 by uh, Pope Innocent III. It was the first internal crusade or the first crusade directed inside of Europe. And, of course, what we know as the witchcraft uh, <coughs> excuse me, epidemics and so forth were also... Uh, involved with this, they were they were uh, destroying surviving um, uh, uh, shamans, midwives, herbalists, magicians, and so forth uh, for the succeeding centuries. And so, by the time the the 16th century drew round, Europe had been pretty much beaten into submission, and the memory of shamanic ecstasy or of personal religious experiences, ecstatic experiences catalyzed by true sacraments, by the entheogens, had been virtually expunged and uh, uh, wiped off the face of the earth. And the, the, the theocracy would have succeeded in their attempt to really efface this from human memory had it not been for the fact that uh, that, that in the 16th century, Europeans, or actually late 15th century, but especially in the 16th century, Europeans began to wash up on the shores of the Americas. And there they found the age of entheogens in full flower. It was as though they had gone back in a time capsule a thousand years, or perhaps 1,500 years, and uh, suddenly the, enthe the entheogenic uh, use of entheogens was state religion. It was common. It was an everyday occurrence. So uh, the proceeding was started to uh, wipe that out in the New World. Exactly. And so <clears throat> what happened was quite predictable. Um, the, the, the Inquisition was established in Mexico in 1578. Uh, well, the, the, the Aztecs or the Mexicas were conquered by Cortez's men in 1521, and their religion was very barbarous in many ways, uh, but it also had a very beautiful and sublime elements, and the Aztecs were a sort of an historical aberration in Mesoamerica anyway. Their, uh, their, the other tribes around them weren't nearly as given to mass sacrifice as they were. But the, uh, the Spaniards used their, their bloodlust for sacrifice as a pretext to destroy other aspects of their culture, and they branded the entheogenic communion as uh, a diabolical communion, as a heresy, and the Inquisition was established in 1578 in the year 1620, uh, I think the 19th of June. The Inquisition formally decreed that the use of peyote and similar plant sacraments was a heresy and that the Inquisition would proceed against um, 
persons that continued using these sacraments uh, as against persons suspect in the Holy Catholic faith. Those were their exact words. And uh, and it was no hollow uh, threat. There were, from the annals of the Inquisition just in Mexico, and this there were p- parallels to this in, in other countries, there were at least uh, something like 90 autos de fe directed against the use of peyote. There were uh, a similar amount for mushrooms and many more for ololiuki seeds. Uh, and so uh, this uh, went on and on, and uh, they attempted to stamp it out. Unfortunately, because of uh, the Mexican Revolution, other political problems, the Catholic uh, religion ran out of steam in Mexico sometime around the middle of the 19th century, and uh, they really failed in their attempt to eliminate this, and it survived in in, uh, in isolated areas. But there are several... Uh, prominent examples of the uh, of this for example the Weechol people continued to use peyote but they were from uh, probably from San Luis Potosi originally from the plains and they took refuge in the remote uh, area where they live now in in Nayarit and Durango uh, the Sierra Huichola, and now they have to make this lengthy pilgrimage to their original homeland to get peyote, uh, but they had to hide out in the mountains in order to escape the persecution of the Spaniards and continue to 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 adopt this religion. It also survived in remote parts of the Sierra Madre among people like the Zapotec and the Mazatec and the Mije and so forth. And so uh, I might mention, though, that the, the Protestant churches have tried to take up the slack where the where the Catholics left off, and they've been uh, they've been trying to stamp this out as vigorously as possible, with the help of the Supreme Court of the United States and other uh, elements. Another. And so, so the nevertheless, um, the the Pharmacratic Inquisition, while it was very uh, successful in Europe and uh, certainly very destructive to the peoples of the New World, it did not succeed in destroying this completely. This survived as in a time capsule in isolated areas, waiting to be disco- rediscovered and uh, by the scientific world. And that's what happened in a dramatic way in 1955 when Gordon Wasson met Maria Sabina and ingested the psilocybin mushrooms. And he was prepared. He he was looking, as he said, he went to Mexico as a pilgrim seeking the grail. His interest was not in anthropological study. His interest was in learning what a sacrament was and trying it and uh, and understanding the essence of ancient religion. And so what the third phase of my theory is what I call the entheogenic reformation. And that involves this, what we're currently living now, a rediscovery of these substances for the modern world and an interest in archaic religion and shamanism that's really quite extraordinary. And uh, it's not something exclusively of the Western world and only related to the scientific world. Uh, There are several, on three different continents, there are important religious movements, syncretic religious movements, in which uh, nominally Christian religions have adopted shamanic inebriants as the sacrament in Christian liturgy. The most, the example best known to us is the, the Native American Church of North America and the peyote religion, which um, began to coalesce in the 1870s, 1880s. It was first incorporated legally as a religion in Oklahoma in 1916, and surprisingly in 1994 was legalized on a federal level in the United States when President Clinton signed uh, the, uh, an amendment to the American Indian Religious Freedom Act of 1986, specifically legalizing this for Indians in the United States. So there's one example. Now, I say nominally Christian. Some of the, some of the, um, some would say that the Christianity in this case is only superficial, as Weston Labar did, or would say that it's, it's only a gloss to impress the authorities and sneak it by the, the Christian uh, right and so forth. But nevertheless, um, the stated purpose of the Native American church is to foster the Christian religion with the peyote sacrament. And so you have the situation where the Eucharist is no longer bread and wine, but rather dried peyote or peyote tea. Well, now that's one example. Another example roughly contemporaneous with that is from Africa, from uh, Western or Equatorial Africa, especially in Gabon. And uh, this is the Bwiti religion, which started mainly among the Fang people of Gabon. And this is also, they've been subjected to missionary activity and so forth. And it's also a Christian religion in which 
powdered root of iboga, or tabernanthi iboga, is used as the Eucharist, very specifically in this case identified as the Eucharist. And uh, in fact, the Buitists even say that we are the true Christians, that the Catholics have, have lost the way that leads you to Christ. They've lost the entheogen. And, uh, and this is, um, to give some numbers to this, the Native American Church of North America has some estimate around a quarter of a million members. It could be higher, but it's no lo- less than that. The Bwiti religion has some millions of members, and it has achieved the character of state religion in Gabon. Uh, it became the French colonial authorities adopted their own pharmacratic inquisition against it and tried to suppress it, and it became identified with the nationalistic anti-colonial movement, and so much so that the first president of uh, of Gabon, after the, the French were driven out, was a Bwitist, and now the, it's it's probably the most important religion in Gabon, and it's spread to several neighboring countries. In Gabon alone, there are 2,000 Bwiti temples, and they take they take this sacrament on a weekly basis. To give a third and final example of the entheogenic reformation of Christianity, there is uh, the example of the ayahuasca churches in South America, which started approximately in the 1930s in, in Brazilian Amazonia in the state of Acre. Uh, the older of the, there are two main ones and several minor ones. The, the major ones are, the largest is called the UDV or the Uniao do Vegetal and also the Santo Daime. Uh, they're both uh, fairly big. Daime is older, UDV is larger. And uh, the Daime religion was started by a, a man named Mestre Raimundo Irineo Serra in the 1930s in Brazilian Amazonia. And this is also a type of a Christian religion in which, in this case, ayahuasca uh, serves as the Eucharist or the sacrament. They call it Daime, uh, and the religion is called Santo Daime. Uh, and, and this has also slowly spread and uh, all over Brazil into urban areas as well. Um, the UDV, or Uniao do Vegetal, was started in 1961 by um, a man named Mestre Gabriel da Costa, and uh, he started the, this um, uh, rival faith to the Santo Daime. And uh, in the case of the Uniao do Vegetal, the potion is called Shawaska or Vegetal. Shawaska means vine tea, uh, roughly. And, uh, it, and like uh, Buiti, and the Native American church, these are, this is a growing phenomenon and it's spreading. It's legal in Brazil. There have been attempts to illegalize these religions in Brazil, two of them by the federal government under pressure from the United States and other, uh, agents, uh, to illegalize it. And they have successfully resisted this and, and it's specifically legalized and they're exempted from the, the drug laws because the potions do contain DMT, which is a controlled substance in Brazil. And they are also spreading to other countries, including the United States. So that is um, partially the subject matter of uh, Jonathan Ott's latest book, The in Age. Twenty-five words or less. In Twenty-five words. <laughs> the Age of Entheogens, and for no extra charge, in the same book, The Angels Dictionary. Um, all of the Jonathan Ott's books are published by Natural Products Company and are available from Jonathan Ott, O-T-T, Jonathan Ott Books, P.O. Box 1251, in Occidental, California, 95465, and you can get a flyer uh, from them on uh, all of Jonathan's books. Jonathan Ott Books, P.O. Box 1251, Occidental California 95465 and that includes uh, not only the latest the age of entheogens in the De- angels dictionary almost said the devil's dictionary well, that was my inspiration for the title and there's ayahuasca analogs his previous book on um, an- analogs to ayahuasca a valuable little book and then pharmacotheon everything you could possibly want to know about entheogens Genic drugs, their plant sources in history, and then uh, a little uh, wonderful little book called the Cacahuatl Eater: The Ruminations of an Unabashed Chocolate Addict, because uh, Jonathan Ott is addicted to chocolate, and definitely unabashed. And you're listening to KPFK Los Angeles, and um, 
Why don't we throw up the phones and for a while, if you want to talk to Jonathan Ott, he is here at KPFK. If it is the 21st of November, 1995, where you are, then uh, you can get through and talk to Jonathan uh, live on the air. Hello. Oh, hi. It's really a great program, although I'm getting tired. Um, the uh, I remember once before uh, you uh, 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 not spoke about um, the uh, use of uh, I mean the practical way of using the um, ayahuasca is through um, making it to a Mr. Coffee Maker with some lemon, something of that sort. You were supposed to have it, Roy, you were supposed to have it in the um, folio or something. No, I wasn't going to put anything in You were going to put some kind of, yeah, it's a recipe in the folio. Um, <laughs> is, uh, can, can you speak about that particular? Uh, about the ayahuasca analogs? Well, that's the ayahuasca analogs. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, oh, it's in the book, you mean? Yes. Uh, but oh. I can say a few words about it uh, anyway. Um, the basically what we call the ayahuasca effect or the ayahuasca phenomenon, uh, which was apparently discovered only once in history in Amazonia, and in my opinion is the most sophisticated pharmacognostical discovery ever made in the ancient world anywhere. It wasn't hit upon by the Chinese or the Hindus or the Europeans. Involves uh, the the fact that by combining two different plant extracts and their aqueous extracts of plants. Uh, you can make DMT active orally. DMT is a very potent entheogen, but it's by itself it's not active orally. It's it's effective when smoked. It's effective when injected. But people have ingested up to a gram of it orally with no effect. And the Amazonian Indians somehow discovered that by combining leaves that contain relatively low amounts of DMT with bark or stem, pounded stems of the ayahuasca plant, which is scientifically Banisteriopsis kaapi, you could render DMT active orally. And what we now know is happening here, and we have elucidated this by human self-experiments or psychoactive bioassays, psychonautic, sorry, bioassays, is that um, the alkaloids that are found in the stem of Banisteriopsis kaapi, they're known to chemists as beta-carbolines, and the most important one is harmine, are inhibitors of an enzyme called monoamine oxidase, especially specifically MAOA. And uh, once this ends, this is the enzyme that decomposes DMT in your stomach so that it doesn't exert an effect orally. And so if you combine the, these two substances or these two plants containing them, you get a, an, a potion in which DMT is active orally. Now, uh, the significance of this as far as ayahuasca analogs are concerned is this, neither the beta-carbolines from ayahuasca stem, nor the DMT from the leaves that are traditionally added to this in, in Amazonia that are called chacruna or it's a chacrona in Brazil. Um, these are not rare substances in the botanical world. There are uh, at least 60 or 70 plants in each category that contain these substances. And what we mean by ayahuasca analogs are combinations of non-traditional sources of these alkaloids. For example, paganum harmala seed is used as a substitute for Banisteriopsis kaapi stem, and it in fact contains about 10 times more beta-carboline alkaloids than does ayahuasca, and from a chemist's perspective is a better source of these alkaloids. There are also better sources of DMT than the leaves that are used in Amazonia, some of which are North American or European or Australian or Asiatic plants. And so uh, simply an ayahuasca analog is made by combining appropriate amounts of, of a, a beta-carboline source with a DMT or tryptamine source and making aqueous extracts. And the lemon comes in because I, I recommend using lemon juice uh, in the water to enhance the solubility of alkaloids in water and minimize the amount of water. So uh, that's, and this of course is explained in much greater detail in the book. complicated. It is. Okay, well, it's in the book, the uh, ayahuasca analogs. Thanks for your call. Thanks a lot. I, sh I forgot to mention, uh, Jonathan Ott is speaking uh, tonight, November 21st, uh, Tuesday night, at the L.A. County Museum of Natural History, which is in Exposition Park, as I recall. 
and um, uh, he's speaking for the Los Angeles Mycological Society. Uh, he'll be talking tonight at 8 p.m., November 21st, Tuesday night, 8 p.m., L.A. County Museum of Natural History. There is an admission charge? Maybe. I'm not sure. Maybe maybe not an admission charge. Um, but uh, I think what there probably you... is, but I don't know for sure. Okay, and what is your subject matter? I'll be speaking yeah. about the age of entheogens, the pharmacratic inquisition, and the entheogenic reformation. Okay, L.A. County Museum of Natural History in Exposition Park, and uh, 8 o'clock p.m. tonight, November 21st, 1995. Uh, hello, hello, you're on the air with Jonathan Ott. Yes, um, I'm sure it hasn't been lost on you that Ambrose Beers also disappeared in Mexico. Yes. Um, I dug out my copy of the uh, Ayahuasca Analogs book to check my marginalia for questions, and as, as I recall, my, my main question was I was kind of more interested in um, those species of plants that didn't have to be, um, how should I say, the source seed found and then cultivated. I was more interested in what might be manifest. So I was, for example, I was more interested in knowing about the beta carbon content of tribulus rather than paganum because that grows everywhere. Uh -huh. And um, also, for example, maybe DMT sources that would be um, readily available in the wild, like uh, the only thing I saw on your list that looked like a possible candidate was either a rindodonax, or what about, for example, mimosa species that are very common in garden varieties like albizia and so forth? Well, um, I, I think mimosa is a good bet, but a lot of the common ones, or well, the one you mentioned, is not known to contain DMT. Um, but uh, one of the best sources, uh, I think probably one of the most promising ones for the future, is a mimosa, mimosa tenuiflora, or its old name is mimosa hostilis. And uh, this is known as that Jordana. That doesn't sound very friendly. No, well, it's spiny. I think that's why it was called hostilis. Um, in in uh, Brazil, it's called Jurema, or and a potion is made from the roots called Vinho da Jurema. In Mexico, it's called Tepescoite, and it's a very important ethnomedicine in Mexico, but applied topically to treat burns, and it's imported into the United States for this purpose. Uh, but it's rather the root bark and uh, and the roots that are used and that contain the high amounts of tryptamines. But seeds of these are already commercially available, uh, and whether the actual root material will be made available commercially or not, I don't know, but I would be most surprised if it, if it weren't so. Uh, as far as tribulus terrestris, uh, I couldn't comment on the, the, I don't have that data in front of me, but it would be a simple enough matter to experiment with it and find out. It's, a, it is a good source of trypt, uh, sorry, of beta carbolines and probably would contain amounts commensurate with paganum harmal. It's in the same family. They look alike too. They yes. They were. Um, but uh, one should exercise extreme caution when experimenting. Now, tribulus terrestris is used as an ethnomedicine. You'll find a lot of references to that in Pharmacotheon. Also, I remember reading something where, where during one of your experiments, you pointed out that you didn't recommend prolonged heating is what it said. Right. And the interesting thing is I think it was actually during that um, conference a couple of years ago out here, uh, I think Dennis McKenna showed a, uh, a film of Yahe preparation, and it looked like they cooked the thing for hours and hours and hours. Now, why is that? <laughs> well, it depends. It depends on uh, on where you're talking about. Um, you get a full spectrum of preparation techniques in the Amazon, running from in the Colombian Amazon. They don't cook it at all, and they just make cold water infusions and only soak it for a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. In uh, in the Oriente of Ecuador, in the Sibundoy Valley. They tend to uh, well cook it for four or five hours. In the Rio Peru, in southern Peru, they cook it for a couple of hours. And in the Iquitos Tarapoto area of Peru, they cook it for 12 or 14 hours. It's an all-day affair. Now, uh, all, these alkaloids are not overly soluble in water, and and the longer in water that's neutral. That's why I recommend adding lemon juice to acidify the water and enhance the sol solubility of the alkaloids in water. Um, uh, so the longer you heat it, 
and heating will, uh, of course, enhance the solubility of these compounds in water. The longer you heat it, you would say you get a better extraction, perhaps. But you're also clearly getting degradation of the alkaloids from the heating. So it's a toss-up. Personally, I feel that just the ecological consideration decides the the problem. It's definitely not energy efficient to heat it for 14 hours if you can do the same thing in 20 minutes, which is what I advocate using my more... Uh, chemical laboratory techniques, just making three extracts, changing the water each time over the same mark or the same residual plant material, and uh, using... I wasn't disagreeing. I was just wondering why some of these tribes did cook it so long. Right. I understand. Well, I think uh, it's... I, I, I don't have a ready answer for that. Um, there's uh, a lot of mysteries involved in this. There are a lot of additives added. There are different strains of ayahuasca that vary greatly in potency. Um, also, of the leaves that are used for the tryptamine sources, uh, we really we talk about ayahuasca, but we really should talk about the ayahuascas because you have not only these differing strains, but about a hundred known additive plants that have been described in the scientific literature, uh, which may be used in various combinations. And so it's a tremendously complicated phenomenon. We've only, in a reductionistic way, uh, teased out just the interaction between tryptamines and beta-carbolines in these potions. But they also add tobacco with nicotine, right. coca leaves with cocaine, various caffeine-containing plants like Wayusa and Yoko, uh, and, uh, and so forth. And uh, Brugmansias that contain tropane alkaloids, Brunfelsias that contain scopolatine, and we know nothing about the interactions of those compounds with beta carbolines or with tryptamines. It's very complicated. Yeah, very interesting. So, incidentally, um, one of the ways in which I like to neutralize the word primitive is to pronounce it primitive. Primitive, or primogenial is a good substitute also, and then it sounds like genial. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Hello, you're on the air with Jonathan Ott. Yes, I was going to ask you, um, are you talking about this ingredients that from the tribes that gives euphoria to the people or something? Pardon me, I didn't understand. Could you turn off your radio, please? Yeah. Are these ingredients that you're talking about gives people euphoria, some sort of high or, or something? Well, uh, euphoria is one of the, one of the normal concomitants of the entheogenic experience, yes. Oh, I see. I, I'm, I, uh, I understand what you're talking about now. Okay. Thank you. Hello, you're on the air with Jonathan Ott. Uh, good morning, Roy. Good morning, John. Good morning. Um, I was wondering, okay, do you have any information on Chansey? Uh, are you familiar with that? Coriaria thymifolia? Yeah, yeah, as seen here in the, of the jungle catalogs. Yes. No, unfortunately, we don't have any uh, solid either dosage uh, from ethnographic reports or chemical information on that. However, uh -huh. um, I would say that it's a, the probability is that the effect is due to what are called andromedotoxins or grayanotoxins in as much as there's a well-known coriaria from... Um, from New Zealand that was involved in a, a, a large outbreak, an epidemic-like outbreak of honey poisoning. And the source was traced to Coriaria tutu. Um, and the symptoms were very similar to what has been described for Shanxi in Ecuador. Uh, giddiness, lightheadedness, the sensation of flying. It's especially associated with sensations of flying. That's Shanxi. one of the things that really interests me along with uh, hallucination. Right. Uh, I've been trying to grow it without success, uh, not from seed. I, I tried to grow it from cuttings that I brought from Ecuador, but they were California? too... Pardon me? In California? Here in the Elf? No, no, in Mexico. Uh, but unfortunately, they were too long in trans and they didn't make it. I haven't tried to start it from seed. Have you had luck with it? Uh, I haven't. I haven't uh, grown it yet. I just have, I have it here in the catalog and I want more. I'm looking for more chemical and also um, how many berries do you eat? Well, uh, the, we don't have, the, uh, as I say, very specific dosage right. information, but the chemical references and information can be found in Pharmacotheon. You can just look it up in the Botanical Index oh, and great, go right great. to the page. And I was wondering, um, the last time I talked to you on Roy's show, this was, uh, I guess, about a year or two ago, yes. um, you mentioned this, I think, I believe it was powdered cinnamon roots that you get at Indian stores. Well, they're not powdered. They're whole seeds, but oh. they're in, in Middle Eastern groceries, and they're sold under the name of Esfond or Ishfond. How do you, can you spell that out? Uh, S-Fond is E-S-P-H. Wait, E-S-P-H? A-N-D, S-Fond. That's the name I've seen. 
E S P H A N D S fund. And that's how that's how I asked for it. And, and yes. Well, what did they sell it for? For incense. For incense. So what do you do, what do you do? You grind up the seeds and. Uh, and yes, you can get that information out of ayahuasca analogs. Okay, and also um, is um, is is the surgic acid I might say from Morning Glory and Hawaiian Woodrow seeds? Are they soluble in? Uh, are they really soluble in ethyl alcohol? I know they are in, in wood alcohol, but I was wondering. I'd, um, I'd like a less toxic route, ethyl alcohol would be the way to Why not go. just use water? They're soluble in water. Well, the, I'm talking about uh, making it into uh, a yellow gum. Uh-huh. Uh, there's a way I have uh, these instructions, but you, use, you have to use uh, methyl alcohol. What you do first is you take like about an ounce of seeds, okay? Uh-huh. And, and you soak, you grind them up in a powder and you soak them for two days and about 100 cc's of petroleum ether. And the reason you do that is to get out the fat, right, the fatty, get that the lipids and all that, and then you throw the liquid away, save the mush, let it right. dry out. Then you soak it for two days in 100 cc's of methyl alcohol. Uh-huh. Okay, and then you, 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 um, save that liquid. So you're asking you if you could substitute extract. ethyl alcohol for methyl alcohol. Say that again? You're asking if you could substitute ethanol for methanol. Right. Um, I, I can't, I don't remember offhand, but again, that information can be readily extracted from Pharmacotheon in the chemical appendix. Right, right. Okay, so, so I just go to a New Beastman store and ask for Right. Expense. Right. Okay, and um, I was wondering if, I, would you ever consider you know, for people who want to just collect it, I know it's in pharmacosian, but would you ever re, uh, consider republishing uh, hallucinogenic plants of North America? Because I would buy it. Uh, I'm not really, uh, because uh, as I say, the um, the other book really supersedes it and is greatly more detailed, and I don't think there's much information. And in I wrote it when I was a student. I'm not really. Uh, Did you also write hallucinogenic sh- mushrooms in North America? Yes. Okay. Well, that's I still that. available. That's not, no, that's out of print also. That I would like to see reprinted, so if anyone's interested out there, I'd be happy to deal on it. I am. And also, what about um, fencyclidine um, type compounds? Um, I'd like to see. I'm not really familiar with them. I haven't had personal experience with them. I'm more involved with the plant type compounds. They're more organic, right, right. Um, And what do you think about iboga? Uh, Iboga, well, I have had limited experience with that also, but I'm certainly intrigued by it. Yeah, and, and another thing is in mushrooms, the hallucinogenic mushrooms, uh, the, the, the psilocin and psilocybin, those are anal- DMT analogs. And yes. Those but they are or- orally active in and of themselves, right, which right. makes them quite but, different from But DMT. if you smoke, on the other hand, if you smoke the mushrooms, then you can get the, the ones that are not. You know, that are only active through combustion. Well, uh, but I don't think there isn't uh, any, no one's found DMT in the mushrooms, to my knowledge. There are other uh, tryptamines, but they seem to be active orally as well. There's, well, there's 4-hydroxy DMT, that's, that's you know, psilocin. psilocybin. Psilocin is 4-hydroxy yeah. DMT, but that's active orally. Right. And it doesn't, uh, we don't really know for sure, but it doesn't seem to be so active smoked. And then there's also, I've heard that uh, in South America, the snuffs, that they, like there's a peanut, that's the one they, they right. inhale, but there's, they also make snuffs out of some of those same you know, species in that area, and they smoke it. And I've also well, heard yeah, well, you're thinking of the anadonanthras, and uh, they're in this, the leguminosae family, the same family as mimosa, and the anadonanthras contain principally bufotenine, secondarily DMT, and some other tryptamines. They are, in fact, you're correct, they are both used in smoked and in snuffs. Yeah, and, and they're active in snuffs. I don't know about smoking. I've only experienced them in snuffs. A sensitive plant in the mimosa family, that's supposed to be active too, the seeds and the roots. It hasn't been found to contain DMT or 5-methoxy-DMT, and there have been a couple of analyses published of it. Oh, huh, because High Times, in one of their, they had a, uh, section on tropical uh-huh. legal hallucinations. I wouldn't put too much stock in, in, in High Times on, for this type of information. Huh. Well, it'd be interesting to check that out, though, to see if... Yeah, sure, it's certainly possible. You can get, you know, try grinding up the seeds and smoking them with the root. Right. All right, well, hey, thank you for both your time. Uh, take welcome. care, everybody, and thanks for the information, too. Sure. Take care now. 
Hello, you're on the air with Jonathan Ott. Yes. Well, I actually got you. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Ott, uh, I was wondering about the legality of some of these things in terms of, well, uh, uh, the plants, uh, uh, many of these plants are legal to be owned as uh, horticultural uh, uh, items, but uh, but their substances within them, like called lysergic amides, uh, lysergic acid amides, and, uh, and other things in the cold and sulfur side, the morning glory family, uh, are regarded as illegal to be uh, used as such. Uh, and I... Uh, I wondered about that, and I also wondered about the legality of 5-methoxy and DMT, uh, okay, well, which was for many years, while DMT was illegal, uh, completely illegal, uh, the 5-methoxy uh, form was available from places like um, oh, Sigma mm -hmm. uh, in, in mm -hmm. St. Louis, um, Missouri, yes. and, um, uh, and uh, other chemical, uh, chemical suppliers. Well, um, as unless there's been a decree in the last couple of months that I don't know about, I've been on a long trip. 5-methoxy DMT is still not scheduled in the United States. Interesting, because uh, the Sigma catalog for the past few years has listed it as a controlled substance. But it says uh, quite specifically uh, but, uh, that no license yeah, is required. It's about three years now. However, I could find nothing in any of the... Um, 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 uh, um, um, federal codes about, or, or even state codes about uh, any yes. specific illegality that was different than the wording uh, of the law back in 1970. When no, it's neither scheduled nor is it on the watch chemicals list. It's in, uh, and you could say the same thing for harming the alkaloids from ayahuasca uh, or in the same category. However, uh, at the moment, uh, Sigma, I know Sigma will not sell compounds like this unless you give them a written protocol saying what you're right, going to use them for. Yes, the, the Even though it's not illegal and not a con on the watch. Yes, Chemicals is what about the, uh, the legal practice of extracting and use? Uh, it was kind of put forth when, because it's never been clear, uh, when uh, the lysergic acid amides and so forth that are in Morning Glories uh, and Woodrow's um, uh, were... Uh, illegalized, but the, the, the plants and the seeds themselves, of course, were not. Uh, it was put forth by, well, it was not the DEA then, it was DN, Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. It was put forth by one of their officials that uh, it was all right, in his opinion, it was all right to uh, 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 have the plants, the seeds, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but the moment you start to grind them up, <laughs> mm -hmm. it becomes a, uh, a felony. Well, you've just, I'm not a lawyer, but, uh, what you've, your question about the legality of, uh, owning plants for horticultural purposes and so forth is a tremendous gray area in the law. And I'll tell you why that is. The, 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 I think the approximate wording of the, uh, of the controlled substances law is that any substance mixture, compound, or preparation that contains any quantity of the following drugs, and then it goes on to mention salts and isomers, and then lists the drugs. But on the schedule, just talking about Schedule 1, where most of these entheogens are found, uh, for example, you will find both mescaline and peyote, both THC and cannabis species. You'll find both, um, co uh, uh, well, not in the Schedule 1, but in other schedules, you will find both uh, co cocaine and the coca plant and and both the opium poppy and its alkaloids, morphine coating. And in Schedule 1, you'll also find both cathinone and the cot plant. So one of the interpretations is if the legislator, le legislature had intended, for example, to prohibit psilocybin mushrooms, they would have listed the species of mushrooms involved, uh, even though they already listed psilocybin. So that's why it's a gray area. And the government has studiously avoided uh, any kind of clarification of this, but in general, in the few cases that have been brought uh, regarding this phenomenon, it hasn't looked good for the defendants. Uh, generally, the courts have taken a fairly liberal interpretation of this and have said, yes, in fact, a plant is a substance mixture compound or preparation, and it doesn't matter whether, you know, in that in some cases both a plant and a drug are listed in its contained drug are listed in the schedule. Um, I would recommend there's a publication called the Entheogen Law Reporter that's published in Davis, California, uh, that has uh, 
always publishes up-to-date information on scheduling and on recent cases involving drug law, and so that would be a good resource to look for. I think you could probably find it in law libraries, or it's a, it's a newsletter. I think it's quarterly, right. $25. It's out of Davis, uh, California, okay. the Entheogen okay. Law Reporter. Uh, um, what, what does this um, uh, matter of extracting, which could be regarded as illegal, to actually go ahead and? Yeah, well, clearly, if there's any extraction or processing them, involved, does that put you at risk personally uh, yes. as an author in uh, uh, describing how to do this? And recommend? Uh, no. I don't know whether you recommend it or whether you use any disclaimer to that. No, the information is still more or less uh, protected by the Constitution in this country, although it's an assault on all sides. But as far as individuals, once there's any grinding up or extracting, then that's clear-cut intent to violate the the drug laws in, the, in their current interpretation. So uh, while the growing of the plant, and in some of them, as you pointed out, are horticultural varieties that are, were already established for for gardening purposes before they were known to be psychoactive. Uh, well, that may be a gray area. Extracting things definitely is not. Okay, thanks for your call. If you want more information from Jonathan Ott, you can see him tonight, November 21st, Tuesday night at 8 p.m. He will be speaking for the L.A. Mycological Society. 8 p.m. tonight at the L.A. County Museum of Natural History which is uh, located, last I heard, in Exposition Park. That's 8 p.m. tonight, Tuesday night, L.A. County Museum of Natural History. Uh, if you're interested in obtaining Jonathan Ott's books, his latest, The Age of Entheogens, or his previous Ayahuasca Analogs, or previous uh, Pharmacotheon, Entheogenic Drugs, Their Plant Sources and History, that biggie, or even... Uh, his ruminations of a unabashed chocolate addict, which has a lot of surprising information about chocolate. Uh, all those available from Jonathan Ott Books, it's O-T-T, Jonathan Ott Books, P.O. Box 1251 in Occidental, California, 95465. I'll leave that information at the KPFK switchboard. I'm sure they're available at Deep River Books in Santa Monica, and are, they're orderable maybe from bookstores? Yes. Published by Natural Products. Book people should be distributing them shortly. Book so. people. Okay. Well, thanks for uh, stopping by again, Jonathan Ott. For Thank a, you for uh, having me. I enjoyed it as mind, always. Mind-stretching uh, session. And you're going to be at Palenque next? Yes, January? the second half of January we're having seminars in in Palenque through the Botanical Preservation Corps, which is a partnership between me, Terence McKenna, Rob Montgomery, and Ken Symington. And we ha always have guest speakers. This year we'll have uh, Sasha and Ann Shulgin, Luis Eduardo Luna, um, Paul Stamets, Stacy Schaefer, and Christian Retsch from Germany. Okay, well, we'll all be sure to go down to Palenque in uh, Maya land uh, in January. Great. I'll look forward to it. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, this is KPFK Los Angeles. Uh, coming up, we're going to go to Palenque, as a matter of fact, uh, last year at Palenque, as we look at entheogenic plants on Something's Happening.